standard. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We're going to say, what in the world does that mean? We'll talk about that a lot. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, that in the day of Christ I may have cause to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Well, the first thing that, that hits us here is work out your salvation. And most of you, if, if you've looked at this verse before, you've thought, wait a minute. I don't think I'm supposed to work for my salvation. Well, you're not. Okay. Most of us know Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And I'll just read them very quickly for us. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not as a, as a result of works that no one should boast. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what in the world is the Apostle Paul saying here that we are to work out our salvation? Many times the Greek has, the, the, the New Testament was originally penned in Greek, and the Greek has a certain nuance to it, just like when we uh, just quoted, uh, be anxious for nothing, Somebody that knows Greek told me that when, when you read it and, and be anxious for nothing, it's actually shouting at you in the Greek. Be anxious for absolutely nothing. It's like he's really worked up. Okay. Don't let anything bother you. Be anxious for absolutely nothing. The same way in, in chapter 2, verse 1, where he says, if there's any encouragement in Christ. Well, the Greek has a, an emphasis there. Yes, if, and you know there is. Okay, so where there's no ifs, ands, or buts about this right now, we are hearing now that we are beloved and that we've been obeying, but now work out our salvation. So the Greek there, the impact of it is like working out a mathematical problem. That was always my favorite thing to do in in high school, right? And didn't wouldn't it? No. And most of us have had teachers or college professors, not only did we have to get the answer right, we had to prove to them through all the steps that we actually did the work. I see some heads nodding out there. You had that same experience. Because you can cheat and look at your neighbor's paper and get the answer. But you can't cheat and work it out. <clears throat> okay? So for each of us, working out our salvation is just doing it, doing what we're supposed to do. One, one writer said it's like working a mine for its gold. You know, it, the gold can be there, but you got to go do something to get it out of there. Okay? <clears throat> so we have to, all right, y'all are going to love this. <clears throat> there was an old song when I was a kid. I swear it was Tennessee Ernie Ford, Debbie. <laughs> that, he, yeah. that he said, you got to walk that lonesome valley. You got to walk it by yourself. Nobody else can walk it for you. You got to walk it by yourself. I know I butchered it. I'm sorry. But. <laughs> uh, you know, there's one reason I love Tennessee Ernie Ford. He's a bass or at least a baritone. I can't sing with all these tenors in our choir. <laughs> but we've got to walk it by ourselves. We got to walk through this life. We've got to walk through our valley. Okay. And so we've got to walk out our faith. So we're not working for our salvation. We're just walking it out. <clears throat> there is a, a quote. I probably wrote it somewhere else, but that Ralph Waldo Emerson said, what you do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. 
Most of you have heard that before. And so it's who we are, what we do, that's going to speak louder than our words. Do we need words? Of course. But it's who you are, how you conduct yourself, how you walk out your salvation <clears throat> that is really impactful to the world. To finish, bring it to completion. By the way, if we live a good life for Christ and we live it out, but not to the very end, we get to the end of our life. A lot of us in this room, like me, I'm <coughs> almost 70. You don't want to give up, do you? We want to finish it. We want to finish this race, like Paul says. Okay, We want to work it out all the way to completion. Don't quit right at the finish line. Okay. Let's keep on working it out. It is your salvation. Somebody else can't do it for you, like the song I very poorly sang, that we've got to walk it out for ourselves. You can't save somebody else. But once God has saved that person, it's their job to get busy obeying God, isn't it? Okay. Can we be an encouragement? Absolutely. I think that's what God calls us to do as we walk out and work out our salvation is to encourage others along the way. Hey, stay in the game. Stay in there. Be anxious for nothing. <laughs> keep, keep, keeping on. Don't give up. Because there are a lot of disappointments in this life. There are a lot of troubles. Just watch the news one night. <laughs> and, and you see troubles galore that we are faced with. And does it want to steal your joy, Paul? It, the, the news just wants us to, to steal our joy. Okay. When I fin turn off the TV and finish watching the news, I go, okay, Lord, please help me forget everything I just heard. <laughs> What's wrong in the world? It get, we got to get back. So how important is Scripture, reading Scripture, obeying Scripture, Praying to the Lord, how important is that it, to our ability to be anxious for nothing? It is everything. That's how we keep on working out our salvation, is to keep on in the Word. By the way, if you see me blow my nose, it's just allergies right now are just hitting me like crazy. I know that doesn't affect anybody else in Houston but me. But, so if I reach for my handkerchief, that's why. <clears throat> and he says to work out our salvation, so we work it out to completion, with fear and trembling. What in the world is that? Why with fear and trembling? Um, it's, I, put, I gave you the scripture there in the Amplified Bible. With all inspired fear and trembling, you serious caution and critical self-evaluation to avoid anything that might offend God or discredit the name of Christ. In other words, we're just to be seriously cautious about our faith. I don't know about you, but I try to be seriously cautious about using the name of Almighty God in vain. There are a lot of ways that we do that. Okay, I think I've told you that that I'm a golfer and on the golf course, I hear God's name quite often, but not in a good sense, okay? And it, I just stop and I've told you, I pray, Lord, forgive that person and thank you, Jesus, for that your name is Almighty. Um, but that is such an awesome name that we're to keep the, the God's name holy. Um, so with fear, was there somebody who wanted to make a comment? Third commandment. The Ten Commandments. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy in God's name. Keep it holy. That's the fourth. Oh, don't cheat. Don't, don't trick me up here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Lord's name is holy. Um, so we're, the fear and trembling is for us to remember to have a proper reverence. 
And I like the word reverence more than I do fear anyway. Just to have a reverence for God, for his name, for the work that we're doing. You know, as we work out our life, as we go through life, shouldn't we have a proper sense of reverence for our role? Okay. That we are a Bible to other people. We're the Bible, we're the only Bible some people will ever read. So that keeps me wanting to be reverent, not just be flippant about God's name, but to be reverent in how we conduct our lives. That's the way I see the fear and trembling, uh, just to do it with reverence. If we slip into sin and failure, before we know it, we might be causing others to slip and fail and fall. Okay. So it is th that kind of reverence that we want to continue to walk our life out um, with sincerity, with purity. We're to maybe fear and that we disappoint the Lord. I don't want, I want to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. I certainly don't want to hear him say, you idiot. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, you're here, but you got here like Paul writes about with smoke. You know, you smell like smoke, <laughs> meaning I went through hell to get there. Um, no, I don't want to disappoint the Lord. Oh, there's a song, Child I Love You, How I Love You. That's what I want to hear, song. Okay, that well done, good and faithful servant, child, I love you. Okay, and don't you want to let that be your life story, your life song? And J.B. Phillips said it's with a proper sense of awe and responsibility. So let's all commit to living out, working out our life with a proper sense of awe. <clears throat> then he says, verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you. So we know, even when I quoted Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 and 9, that God is at work in us. And that word, at work, the Greek word there is energon. And we get the word energize from that Greek word. Okay, God is the one who is at work to energize you. So if you feel any energy in the morning, thank God. If you don't feel any energy in the morning, pray to God <laughs> that he give you the energy because it's his ability to work that's at work inside of you. Even what we do is because God gave us the energy, okay? Even our energy to do what we do is not our own. It's God. I thank God I'm an energetic person. Because I thank God that he gave that to me and gave me a desire to study his word. And you know what? I, I just thought I'd encourage everybody here. You've heard me say before how many people impacted my life to encourage me to read the Bible. Why don't you and I do that for other people? When you meet, especially somebody, high school is such a great age. To take a high school student and say, it could be your grandchild, it could just be a student you meet, say, have you ever read the Bible all the way through? Well, most of them will say, never. Okay. Well, it only takes 15 minutes a day if you'll promise to do it every day. And you can read the Bible from Genesis all the way to Maps. Okay. I mean Genesis to Revelation. It's just a joke. Okay. But all the way to the Maps in the back. Okay. And it's amazing when the first man that told me that and I read the Bible all the way through, I went, it really works. I did do it. Okay. You can do it. Okay. So that's part of us growing is to read God's word. Then later uh, when Debbie and I got married, um, several years later, I was not in high school, <laughs> uh, that another preacher challenged us to read the New Testament uh, through 30 times, and it takes two and a half years, but you read it seven chapters a day, every day for 30 days. 
Well, I decided I didn't like that challenge. I shortened it to two weeks, 14 days. I read it 14 times in about a year and a half. There are some things that come out of the page at you when you read the same passage over and over and over again every day for two weeks. All of a sudden, when Jesus says certain things in Matthew, you go, oh, that's why he says it's more important to enter the kingdom of heaven maim or blind than it is to have your arm and your eye. That's what he meant. Okay, he was using hyperbole. It's just that important. So things will jump off the page. So if you can encourage somebody else to go deeper in their Bible study, you've in, you maybe help energize somebody else. Will it energize you along the way? Absolutely. So we see in, in Titus 2 that he says to, to Titus, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So there's a reason why we live with a, a, a tendency to be, when I say sober, it's not just lack of alcohol, but to live honestly, carefully, you're walking out your, your salvation carefully. And if you call on the Father, 1 Peter 1, 17, who without respect to persons, he judges according to every person's work, we should pass the time of our sojourning here in this life in reverence. Okay. So what we do in this life does matter. Okay. <clears throat> and I like Deuteronomy 10, 12, where Moses says, and now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee, but to reverence the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And Jesus goes on and to with all your might when he quotes it. Okay. So we do want to use our whole heart and mind and life and energy to serve the Lord. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, reverence God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Okay, so if you ever wonder, what is God's will in my life? Obey. <laughs> what is part of obeying? Be anxious for nothing. Absolutely nothing. Don't let anything steal your joy. We used to have, uh, Mike Richards was our state senator, uh, and he also had a radio program, and he closed off every radio program with, don't let anything steal your joy. And I still remember those words to this day. Um, just, you cannot let anything steal your joy. We, we're going to get bombarded with bad news every single day. We've got to keep our joy. Keep on keeping on. Because God is working in us. He is energizing us. <clears throat> we are to also grab hold of the times when the Holy Spirit stirs us. I think the pastor said something about that this morning in the sermon, that when you feel the Holy Spirit stirring you, don't say, oh, thank you, that was nice. No, do it. If he stirs you to call somebody, pick up the phone and call. If he stirs you in the energy of the Holy Spirit to go visit somebody, go visit them. Don't just send a text message, yeah, I'm praying for you, go do it. All right, Debbie's laughing at me, what did I? Oh, no, no. What did I do? I was just, Joanne got asked to do something. I said, through the Holy Spirit, stirring. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. I'm watching you guys, okay? So if I see somebody laughing really hard, I'll be, I'm a, okay, I'll just step in it somehow. Okay. <clears throat> so when, when God does stir us, he'll give us the energy to go do what he stirs us to do. Okay. And that's part of our obedience. These stirrings, often are of God. And let's grab hold of them, do it while the Spirit's prompting you. How many of us have had a prompting of the Spirit to do something and then we forgot? And it's a week later and we find, oh, that's right, I was supposed to call that person. <coughs> or go do this. Many times, 
I used to do this more faithfully, Debbie, but I used to keep a pen beside my bed. So it seems like I wake up and I've got these thoughts. And we ought to have a pen and a pad by our nightstand so that we wake up, write it down, so we don't forget to do what the Spirit prompted us to do as we're waking up. <clears throat> so God doesn't leave us alone in our salvation. He works in us, moves us, stirs us. The tragedy is if we refuse to respond to these stirrings, we're not following God's will. Now, I, Joanne was talking to me about illustrations, and so I thought of an illustration, Joanne, okay, that this city boy, okay, I grew up in the city, so I wasn't all that countryfied whenever I was growing up. And so I'll just make it on me that I didn't know what a chainsaw was when I went out to the country. This guy said, Rand, I bet I can cut more wood than you in an hour. And so I'm taking that chainsaw and I'm just manually sawing away. He's, he's uh, away from me and he is just sawing the wood like crazy. And I'm sweating, I'm tired. And he came back and he goes, Rand, I never heard you turn on your saw. I said, what do you mean turn it on? He, he pulled the rip cord, you know, and, and, and started it up. And there's a chain just moving. It had the energy. All I'd have to do is stand and do a right through the wood. That's us if we try to live the Christian life in our own strength. The power, the energy is from the Holy Spirit. It will just turn it on. Let the Holy Spirit work in you. Use his energy. It's not our, our strength. He can energize us. Yes, I'm the idiot who didn't know how to use a chainsaw. I do now. <laughs> I know the power of the Holy Spirit is way better than me doing it all my own strength. Okay. So Paul says in Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable in God, which is your reasonable service. You want to know what God wants from us? Present our bodies a living sacrifice to him that's holy and acceptable unto God. Okay. So there's a reason why we try to do the best we can um, all the time is that we are doing the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, now we go into verse 14, where he says, in fact, I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. Do everything without murmuring. I, I use the word grumbling, without grumbling and complaining, questioning the providence of God. Okay, so we saw the, the, the little girl in the, in the video with the pastor this morning. She got the news she wasn't expecting for a baby. She wanted a baby sister. She was getting a baby brother. She let it be known. She was not happy. Okay. That is an extreme example of grumbling. <laughs> Murmuring. Okay. But can we not be that same way? We can murmur and grumble and complain about so many things. And how many of you enjoy hearing somebody else just grumble and complain? Okay. Most of us try to walk away from that kind of individual. Okay. Yeah, good to see you. All right, bye. <laughs> Hope you get better. So if we don't like hearing it, should we be guilty of the grumbling and complaining? You hear what I'm saying? Now, I will tell you there's a time to be honest. This is not grumbling and complaining. It was just last Sunday that as, as we were driving to church, Debbie and I were at each other's throats verbally, okay? And we were not having a good day. So she, she walked on into church ahead of me and I stayed back to pray. And the first guy to greet me at the door uh, said, Rand, how you doing today? And I said, honestly, this isn't my best day ever. <laughs> and he goes, problem with the wife? <laughs> yeah. He said, let's pray, brother. Okay. And it worked. Okay. Because what he also said was random. Many times it's us. We're at fault. Okay. 
So what did you do wrong, Rand? <laughs> a faithful Christian brother did the right thing. But how did it start? I didn't murmur and grumble and complain. I just was honest and said, no, this isn't my best day. So I encourage you every now and then, what do we usually do? We see somebody at church, how you doing today? Fine, how you doing? Fine, how you doing? Fine, everything's great. I've got a friend and we ask him how he's doing. He goes, fantastic. <laughs> it ain't true. <laughs> so maybe we don't know how somebody's doing because the rest of the time we're not honest with them. So I'm encouraging you, if it really is a bad day, don't murmur and grumble, but honestly go to a Christian brother or sister and say, no, this isn't my best day. I could use some prayer. Okay. Otherwise, we don't know what somebody else is hurting, do we? So I'm just being honest with you right there that last week wasn't my best Sunday. <laughs> but the Lord was faithful and he brought us through it. <clears throat> now, there is a kind of grumbling <clears throat> that can be causing dissension even in the church. If we grumble about what the pastor is doing, the direction of the church, we're grumbling to other people. What are we doing? We're causing dissension in the church. Okay. Uh, if you grumble about your back is hurting, okay, that's one thing. They okay, just don't do it all the time. But if you grumble and murmur about what the direction of the church is, we are not creating unity in the church when we do that, are we? Okay. We're creating disunity. So let's try our best not to have behind the back grumbling, whispering about other people that we are truly walking out our Christian life without complaining, arguing, and disputing in the church, in our families. You know, there's a there's a great way to tear up a family, and that's to argue compete, to talk bad about each other. That's how you break up a family. I'm forgetting my quote, Debbie, but it's, I used to read it every day. The, 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 oh, well, it won't come to mind. But it's just so important that we, if we want good, solid families, we're straight and honest with each other. We don't backbite. We don't complain. We don't compete against each other. No, we're one family. And as Christian brothers and sisters, are we not one family? We are. So we don't need to compete with each other. Love doesn't even consider wrong stuff. Okay, Debbie's quoting uh, 1 Corinthians 13 in our Amplified Version that love hardly even notices a suffered wrong. So when we are hurt by somebody in our family, Debbie and I are constantly quoting it to each other. We hardly even notice as a suffered wrong. We're just gonna keep on loving that in-law that just treated us badly <laughs> or that grandchild that just walked right by and didn't give us a hug or, you know, you, love hardly even notices a suffered wrong. We just keep on with our, our Christianity, with our Christian walk. <clears throat> and it can lead to disputes and turmoil and divisiveness. I don't want to be guilty of causing division uh, in our family or in our Christian family. And it's the, these murmurings were the very sins that brought judgment on the Jews in the wilderness when Moses was leading them out of Egypt. They started complaining right away. It was better back in Egypt. <laughs> God had to judge them. And they wandered for 40 years in the desert because they're murmuring and complaining and grumbling. <clears throat> do you have a right to ask questions of your leaders and offer constructive criticism? I would propose to you, yes. But is there a right spirit and a wrong spirit to offer constructive criticism? I think most of you have dealt with that. You've had somebody come to you and offer you a 
uh, suggestion. Glenn's a, a longtime friend and a business owner, and you've had the people come to you and say, Glenn, I really don't like the, the way this is going. Daily. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, but if they say, I've got a suggestion that might help. That's a whole lot better than saying, I just don't like the way you're handling things. Nobody feels good about that. But if you have a suggestion, I've had lots of success, and I know you have too, where you see something is not going the way it ought to go, and you go to the person in charge and say, by the way, this is what's happening. You may not be aware of this. You might want to consider praying about this type of action. And lo and behold, things change. So we do have a right to offer constructive criticism in a constructive manner. Okay, don't read the scripture and me quote it to you and think that, oh, you can never complain about anything. I didn't say complain. I just notice here's what's going on and offer uh, constructive criticism or even ask questions. Now, did you really mean this by what you said? Because many times, did we really understand what the other person said? Many times not. We could be um, hearing it wrong. No, I won't use that as an example. Okay. Because when you're at home, there's a lot of times there's other things on your mind when your spouse is talking to you. Okay. And you didn't really hear what they just said. <laughs> Debbie knows I'm constant. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I was doing something else. I didn't hear a word you said. I heard noise, but I didn't hear the words. <laughs> and so I, please say it back to me again. Make sure I understand what you just said. It's us men. We're, we, by the way, men cannot multitask. It's one thing at a time. <laughs> All the ladies in here are going, yeah, we know that already. <laughs> So that kind of grumbling, complaining, it divides, it tears down, it pushes people away from church. If all they hear you say is negative things about church, why would they want to come here? Okay. It makes us self-centered. It, it elevates our selfish opinions. Um, I said to, in my notes here to go to Galatians 5, 19 through 24, so I'm going to do that real quick. Galatians 5, 19 through 24. Now that, oh yeah, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, that's hating, you know, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Debbie, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, disputes dissensions, this is what we're just talking about, factions, um, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I have forewarned you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice such things, not occasionally do one of those things, they practice them regularly, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So as a, as a whole, if that's all we're stuck in is those kinds of things, I would be careful. <laughs> Did you really accept Christ? Now, I'm not saying you work for your salvation. We're just working it out. But if we live and we're only in the deeds of the flesh, then there's something wrong. We're not living yet in the Holy Spirit working our life. Because in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yes, I say that verse to myself just about every day in Houston traffic. <laughs> it, it is a trying of your patience to drive in Houston. We were, we were driving home from dinner last night, and this we're on the freeway 60 miles an hour, and all of a sudden this man just pulls in our lane and just throws on his brakes. I'm like, what is up? Patience. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, we can do this. I can do all things through Christ, not by myself, but with the energy that he provides inside my life. <clears throat> Somebody's laughing in here. I'm, I'm looking down. Okay. <laughs> Same thing. 
Okay. I'm reaching. I'm really reaching Debbie and Joanne this morning. So I, that's good. <laughs> that's good. I love it. A, a teacher loves to hear some feedback. Okay, that's why I look up at you most of the time. <laughs> Believers, verse fifteen, <clears throat> that we are to uh, prove ourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God. Um, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Oh, I was hoping we had time to get here. Wow, I'm using more time than I thought. Uh, so we live in a crooked, perverse generation, y'all. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> yeah, you already knew that. And that word crooked is the... The Greek word here, I wrote it in here, now I can't find it, but it's the word scolios. And you get the word scoliosis, a curvature of your spine from this Greek word, scolios. So you get the picture of a crooked generation. It's not straight. It's not right in word. There's pain when you're not straight. We live amongst a crooked people with a crooked spine. Some of them, no spine at all. Okay. So what? how should we be in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? We're to be lights to that world. Like I said, we're the Bible. Some people, we're the only Bible some people ever read. So we want to be that kind of a light. We want to know that we're not complaining all the time. We have a joy to our life. You know, if you walk around with a frown on your face all the time, who wants to be like that? <laughs> okay. You want to be able to look up. I Constantly, when I'm walking somewhere, I'm looking up at the people and looking at them, see if they ever look up. How many people do you notice just never even look up at you? Head down, don't want to look. Okay. I want to be the opposite. I want to be looking and they want to hear, they look up at me and I want to smile. Hi, how you doing? That we're a light in this crooked and perverse generation. So let's live our life blamelessly, harmless, that we're, we're not mixed with evil. Uh, our thoughts are pure, they're uncontaminated, and that we're above reproach, that we can not be, I knew a, I'm not gonna dare say the man's name, but I, I knew a Christian man that was a, supposedly a good businessman he's quite wealthy but when you talk to people that were around him they'd say yeah but he's a hard blankety blank to deal with okay so we don't want to be that kind of a person either but yeah we're successful but we drive other people insane on our way to doing it okay so living a life of light and purity and being harmless and above reproach that's what the Holy Spirit's causing us to. <clears throat> so in verse 16, well, yeah, live a life in verse 15 that is absolutely straight in a world that is warped and twisted. That's a quote from Barclay. In verse 16, in the Amplified, I, which I think I gave to you at your table, holding out and offering to everyone the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to rejoice greatly because I did not run my race in vain nor labor without result. So we want our lives to count for Christ that we are holding out the word of life to everyone. Just think about the responsibility of holding out the word of life to the people you meet. I don't want to be guilty of driving anybody away from Christ. And you, you know, if you're a Christian, you want to draw other people to Christ. So let's live our lives in such a way that we draw people to Christ, not drive them away. Well, anybody here want to live your life a little differently now? And try to walk this for the right reason to walk a straight and narrow life. Not to be the, the Pollyanna, but to be the light for the world. 
that to be that Christian light that might win somebody else to Christ because they, they look at you and go, wow, you're different. Why are you so nice? Why are you so pleasant? Why are you always smiling? Don't you want to be that kind of person? Okay. Let's pray, and then if there's any time, Butch, that they can visit at their table. Okay. I'll just close this in prayer. Lord, I just pray that you've used something that your humble servant has said this morning, that it would encourage us to live a better life, a holy life, that we could be a light to this crooked and perverse world. We see so much bad all the time. Lord, I pray that we could bring good and joy and peace into other people's lives. I pray this in the power of the Holy Spirit that you would empower us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. And pray God. Thank you.